Garris, and welcome once again to the Fantasy Film Festival. The Fantasy Film Festival is a vehicle for science fiction, fantasy, and horror films here on the Z Channel, presented as they were intended, <coughs> uncut, and uninterrupted. We emphasize imagination here, and a good example of that is The Evil, which you'll be seeing in just a few minutes. The Evil is a horror film, a gothic horror film, about a haunted house, the devil, and ghosts. Uh, it's a tried and true formula, but there's still new life left in it, as you'll see in the film. Our guests tonight are the star of the evil, uh, the proverbial star of stage, screen, and television, <laughs> Mr. Richard Crenna, and the director of the film, Gus Traconis. Um, let's start with you. Richard, you were able to move from uh, the squeaky-voiced adolescent TV star of Our Miss Brooks uh, on up to a successful writer, producer, and director. How do you think you were able to avoid the pitfalls of typecasting for those roles? Well, uh, I was uh, involved in, in characters that have been the graveyard for a number of other uh, actors. I think um, um, it was the fact that the, the, the roles I was playing were so far from my own character, my own personality. Uh, I was quite unlike Walter Denton, even at the time I was playing, <laughs> if you can believe that. I think uh, and believe then when I, when I did Luke McCoy, I had the same, uh, the same reaction. I was always considered an actor in retrospect. Um, at the time I was doing the show, people figured that was the guy, I, you know, I, was, I was the guy that I was playing, and which was in one sense complimentary, but in fact, uh, um, as an actor, you always, I, I think, um, um, deep down inside resent the fact that people don't understand that you're really acting. Okay. Gus, let's ask you how the, uh, the evil came about in the very beginning. Uh, let's see. Uh, the men with the money, the executive producers, had a script. They hired a producer, Ed Carlin, who called me and asked me if I would be interested. And uh, I read the script. I said I would be interested if a major rewrite was involved. He said, okay. And that's how it began. Now, you'd never really done a genre film before, had you? No. Are you particularly drawn to the Well, genre? not a horror, horror genre film. I've done other kinds of genre films, but mm -hmm. not a horror film. I was fascinated by the idea of using effects the way the, uh, the script was written. So well, Richard, you had never really done a, a horror film before either. No, I had not. This was my first experience. Uh, but uh, as an audience, I'd always been fascinated. Uh, uh, by the so-called horror films, and uh, uh, when the opportunity presented itself, I, I really jumped at the chance. It was um, it was an opportunity to do something I'd always enjoyed as an audience, and um, uh, people love to be frightened, and I always, as a kid, and, and even to this day, I enjoy films that frighten me, and so uh, uh, I plunged in with both feet. What do you think? Literally. <laughs> <laughs> You'll see what he means later. Uh, what do you think the appeal of a horror film is? Why, why do you think people want to be frightened? Why do you want to be frightened? Or what scares you? Well, I, I don't know. I, I remember as a kid, I used to uh, uh, take a flashlight and go into abandoned houses and poke around at night and pretend it was filled with ghosts. And I think fantasy is, is uh, 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 imagination is, is probably more frightening than anything. I think that was one of the, the charms of, uh, of early radio where I got my beginnings. Shows like Lights Out, uh, Witches' Tales, uh, shows of that type, uh, which allowed you to use your imagination. As Norman, Cor Norman Corwin uh, uh, referred to radio, it was the theater of the of the mind. And uh, I think that um, horror films allow a, a lot of that. You'll see a lot of that, a mixture of that in, in the film that we've done. Uh, there's always a very, it, it's very difficult to draw the fine line between what you actually show on screen and what you allow the audience to imagine. And I find that uh, as an audience, I'm always much more frightened by the things that I'm allowed to imagine. And I think Gus did a, a wonderful job in, in mixing that in our film. All right, Gus. Uh one of the main stars of the film is the house itself, mm -hmm. the enormous haunted house of the evil. Uh, where did you find that? What, what is that building? That's uh, a building that was built by the railroad at the turn of the century in New Mexico, Las Vegas, New Mexico. It uh, has 500 rooms, sulfur baths, and ironically, some of the dialogue in the script that was written before we found the house really coincided with what was there 
at the house. So in the script they mentioned the 500 rooms and sulfur baths and that was before the location was even found? That's right. That's pretty surprising. That's right, yeah. Well how long did it take to film The Evil? 30 days. 30 shooting days. Right. And basically the film is all shot in this house. Did that create any problems for... Well 95 percent of the picture is shot inside the house uh, without giving away the plot. Um, yeah, you know, cabin fever, we talk about, we talk, we've talked about cabin fever. You take a crew and you take actors, you put them together, you lock them in a house for a period of 30 days and uh, things begin to happen to them psychologically. Mm -hmm. Now, anxiety. Yeah, anxieties, different kinds of anxieties. Some things are funny, some things are not so funny. Richard can tell you about that. <laughs> but uh, it helped the picture because some of it came across in the film. Uh, but in our personal day-to-day -day living with one another, sometimes it became difficult. Right. Well, was that a problem for you, Richard, the cabin fever <coughs> experience? Well, um, no. I'm one of those, uh, um, I don't know if I'm a rare exception, but I enjoy locations. I love to film out of Hollywood. I love to film in actual locations. I find that it helps a great deal. It helps me as an actor. Um, uh, but uh, it was interesting. We had, we had a choice of 500 rooms in the house, and each of us could select our own dressing room. Mm. There was one, one, one time when you didn't have to fight for the largest dressing room. They, they just gave you a key and they said, go find a room. And so we all found rooms, and that was yeah. one way we avoided each other. One had a room on the fifth floor, one had a room on the second floor in the back, one had a room. And it was, it was wild, the decor. Mm -hmm. the, uh, Joanna Pettit, had, um, she had went out and bought rugs and carpets and plants. and right. uh, She moved in. I mean, we all literally moved in. Uh, because the problem is, uh, as Gus says, when you're on a film and you're, and you're in that situation where you're all in one environment, it's difficult to get off and have those moments by yourself, which I think are essential when you're creating something. The other thing and was uh, that we worked a half a day and a half a night. We would start at 12 in the afternoon because half of the picture is done at night. Oh, right. And then we would shoot for half a day light, and then we would go into night shooting, and we shoot all night. So that means that there was never a break for any of us to get away from one another, mm -hmm. to enjoy the evening over dinner or to go out to a disco, whatever, just, just to get away from one another. So we were constantly together. Mm -hmm. and, uh, like a submarine crew, really. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I can imagine. It's the claustrophobia. <laughs> uh, special effects are another star of the film. Uh, you get thrown about the room quite a bit in this film. Do you have any scars from that? Well, I have some strawberries, you know, <laughs> one of those little painful rug burns. Uh, uh, that was quite a, uh, a problem for us because uh, when you see the film, you'll understand that, uh, that it was necessary that the character I played be motivated uh, by some unseen force uh, in rather violent fashion. Absolutely. Uh, I won't reveal entirely how that was done, but it was a combination of cables, uh, uh, ropes, uh, pulleys, wind machines, dust, dirt, um, etc. And uh, not without some incident at one time, they forgot to turn the motor off that was dragging me across the room. And uh, I ended up in Albuquerque. <laughs> <laughs> Going through Albuquerque, I suggest right, they uh, stop and turn right, it off. On a wire. Right. Somebody cut the wire, yeah. finally. Well, I noticed in the credits that there was a listing for someone called the Demon. Uh, and there's nobody that I think looks like a demon in that film. Uh, what happened there? Well, we, uh, we had an idea that one of the demons in this house was about three feet high. So we found a small man, a midget, you want to call him that, and we put him in a little suit little hair suit. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's what happened. <laughs> That's exactly was, what happened. That was it. Each, each, each time he appeared, the cast laughed. <laughs> and if the cast laughs, you know that the audience is going to laugh, so that there was a problem. Yeah. And that's one of the things we were talking about, the decision that has to be made at some point. What is revealed physically and what, has, what, what, what needs to be left to the imagination of the audience? And uh, uh, we found that after filming it, uh, you know, we all went to the dailies and laughed and said, well, that, that's never going to work. I mean, it's, yeah. uh, it's impossible. It's silly. Uh, then it, 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 Gus made the decision that that character would be an offstage character, an unseen character. And I think it works much to the advantage of the picture, not to see the character. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was the case of the demon. <laughs> the yeah, the wacky demon, demon of the evil. <laughs> who, who disappeared. <laughs> right. uh, 
the star, one of the stars again was a special effects <coughs> guest. Tell me a little about the man who created them and, oh, and the lightning and rain. I know you had yeah. a problem. Well, he, he was, he was, I guess you have to be kind of crazy to be an effects man, I think. I mean, you got to be a young child that never quite grows up and you've got all these toys. And to him, everything that he had was a toy. And sometimes when he would get upset, he would just, you know, run around and scream and yell and say, I'm taking my toys and I'm going home. And we all realized at one point that he really was the star of the film. And if at any point he decided to leave, we could just close up shop. So it became kind of like a joke. Now, you know, we have to, oh, we can all be replaced but our effects. <laughs> he's, sure. he's the guy that we got to, you know, pamper and uh, be uh, nice to. But he did some really, I think, wonderful things. Things that were improvisations as we went along. Like we'd come up with an idea, wait a minute, let's get Richard and throw him across the floor, or let's fly somebody, or let's burn this person up. Uh -huh. And he would say, wait, I got an idea, let me try this. Like for instance, we, we came up with a scene where the house closes up, and Richard was saying, well, we've got to really feel that they can't get out. Well, the one way to do it is you try to break windows. If the window, windows don't break, how do you get out? The doors don't open and so on. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, if you take a table and you throw it, and the table hits a window but comes up at you, let's say, I'm giving away some of the story, and maybe I shouldn't be doing this, I don't know. I don't um, think that's and really he said, well, I got, a, I got a way to fly the table. I know what I'm going to do. So we did a scene with that, where they pick up a table and they're <clears throat> out of their anxiety, they run for a window, and the table just flips up over them, and they stand there without, without the table in their hands. But that kind of improvisation went on throughout the picture. Right. Do you think there's a... Oh, I'm sorry. No, I think you're always faced in a, in a film like this. If there's a hole in the story, and I think we, we found you can, you can make that comment relative to almost any film. Uh, people find holes in every picture. The deer hunter, the, the people have complained about certain things in the deer... Every, every picture, somebody will find fault with it. And uh, it's always been my contention, if there's a hole in the story, point to it. Allow the characters to examine that hole with the audience, and the audience will then go along with you more often than not. They'll say, oh, I see, yeah, mm -hmm. sure, well, of course. They can't break the windows with a table, then what are they going to do? Or with a stick or anything else, the table's, you know, then we'll buy that. Right. Particularly and in the genre. Yeah, this is an important example <coughs> of the gothic horror genre. And uh, you'll be seeing it in just a few moments, The Evil. You'll have a lot of fun. It's a recreational horror film. I think we'll all agree that there's not Absolutely. any real message other than to have a good time and to get your pants scared off. So thank you for joining us on the Fantasy Film Festival, and we'll see you next time. Thank you to Richard Crenna and Gus Traconis for joining us here again. Thank you.